All right. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, hopefully you guys got a chance to read the paper. Um, I'm not going to make you like tell me whether or not you read this paper or not, but hopefully you did. It was three pages. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. This is, I think, a fascinating paper that needs a couple times reading it through to like really process what's going on in this. How many people have read this paper before in some other class or in some other like time? Just one of you. Okay, good. So this is this is all relatively new. Feel free to jump in on the other times you've read that you've talked about this and anything you know uh, about this. Um, so reflections on trusting trust. This is kind of about security is really what this is all about, right? And it's kind of about, I mean, it's a little bit about security and it's, a, it's also a little bit about sometimes you have to throw your hands up and trust somebody if you don't know that you can trust anybody in your chain of where the programs or whatever came from, well, then something like this could happen, which is, which is what we'll, uh, we'll talk about. And, I, and if you read it and went, oh, I don't really get what's going on, great, we'll, we'll chat about it. So uh, the person who wrote this, Ken Thompson, um, is a, he was one of the creators of Unix, I mean kind of the driving force behind Unix. He spent most of his time at uh, Bell Labs. So in the 1970s, 80s kind of time frame, there were two big places in the country that were not universities that were doing like very cool research into computing and like kind of pushing the, the edge forward in computing. Of course, they were doing stuff here at Berkeley and, and MIT and so forth as well where they were doing lots of this stuff. But he was at Bell Labs. Bell Labs was one of them. Where was the other one? Another big lab, research lab. Xerox Park, which happened to be here, Palo Alto Research Center, which is part of Xerox. Now, AT and T, Bell, and uh, which AT and T and Bell are kind of the same. Um, and Xerox were these giant companies that spent a lot of money on research. And some companies these days are also spending a lot of money on research, like Facebooks and Google. They're spending some. They're, you know, we'll see if the, the kind of the Google's doing great stuff in AI now with their AlphaGo and so forth. So I mean, I think that's transitioning a little from various companies, but. You know, Xerox was doing cool computing work back then, and Bell was also doing cool computing work. Specifically, this guy with one of his compatriots, Dennis Ritchie, uh, who invented the C programming language. Um, and uh, Ken Thompson actually invented the B programming language, which you've probably never programmed in because it came before C and it wasn't as good for lots of for various reasons. Um, but that's the inspiration for C came from his uh, his language. Um, he also is, uh, I believe he's still there, although he may have retired, but I believe he's still at Google where he was one of the developers of the Go language. So if you use Go, you've also uh, done something that, uh, that Ken Thompson has um, worked on. Um, and UTF-8 was another one that he kind of came up with. And UTF, did we talk about that in here, UTF? It's, it basically, it's a character set that is, allows for characters from multi-languages, not just English, which is kind of the, um, I told your story at lunch today, or the faculty lunch, about the uh, COBOL, like the Grace Hopper demoing her language in both French and German, and uh, Sperry Ram people going, oh, don't do that, or whatever. Um, uh, anyway, so Ken Thompson won the Turing Award because of uh, his, uh, uh, basically because of all the different things he did, but mainly because of developing Unix, because Unix is so uh, huge. And even in 1983, when it was only about 10 years old or so, people were saying, wow, this is, a, this is a real deal. So that's when he, with Dennis Ritchie, won the Turing Award. And the paper you read was his talk on it. So kind of a cool talk. Uh, I don't know if you noticed in the talk or in the, the paper, he said, uh, you, should, you should dance with the person you came to the dance with or whatever. I forget the exact thing. But he didn't. He said, I'm not going to talk about Unix. I'm going to talk about this other cool thing. And I think a lot of the coolest talks happen to be about smart people who did something cool talking about something else that's cool they're doing now. Um, speaking of which, next Tuesday night, I don't know if you got an email about it, you probably did if you're a CS major or uh, otherwise, there is a talk by Don Knuth. He does a Christmas lecture every year. Um, it's, it has nothing to do with Christmas normally, but it's just when he does it. Um, and he's doing his talk next year on dancing links, which is a, which I don't know anything about, but supposedly it's kind of using linked lists in this fancy way and whatever. And, and of course, Don Knuth is uh, um, a fun guy to listen to. And like his brain is you know, this big. So it's, it's uh, great. So anyway, next Tuesday night, I believe, I want to say 7 PM, 6 or 7 PM. Um, so uh, think about going to that. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's what um, 
Thompson did, and he wrote this little kind of throwaway thing for this Turing Award uh, where he talked about the stuff we're going to talk about today, and it's now considered a seminal computer security paper. Like everybody in computer security like knows about this paper because of the big ideas that it brings up um, and the big challenges that it brings up for being, for trusting other people. And we also talked about this before, by the way, where we have to trust our browser every day. When you go to Amazon, did you ever, like, you know, you don't transfer any keys or whatever. You have to trust that that the public key you're getting from Amazon is the public key from Amazon. How do you do that? Your browser tells you that. Like, that's the trust part of it. So um, there is some trust in the world, and you guys do it whether you know it or not. <laughs> about this. Okay, so uh, let's go through the various stages that he talked about in the paper. And if you didn't read the paper, um, then feel free to ask questions about this. But he basically talks about three stages of um, of building an interesting program to do, so, like compiler really is what he's talking about, and how these various stages allow him to insert what he calls a bug. And it's not a bug in the sense of a bug being uh, like, like a problem in your code. It's a bug in the sense of like a listening device sort of bug. Like that's kind of what he means by that. I, I don't, the terminology was a little strange that he said that. Um, but anyway, uh, so here's kind of what he said. And I put a bunch of the text in here and we'll, we'll go through this. Um, he says, I'm a programmer. So he's a darn good programmer, by the way. Um, and he puts this on his tax forms, which is kind of fun. Um, and he calls this the cutest program he ever wrote. Now, there's kind of questions about whether he actually wrote it or not and did this and not. And I think at some point he kind of said, yeah, okay, I kind of did at one point. I actually built this thing and it did exactly what I said. So you never know. Um, now, he, he goes to this little caveat. Look, back before people were all uh, uh, distracted by things like video games, we would actually do programming exercises. Not a bad thing to do even these days. We're going to do one today. Um, and he said uh, one of them was producing this he, he calls it the shortest self-reproducing program. Okay, and then he makes this comment, since this is an exercise divorce from reality, the usual vehicle is Fortran. And he says, actually, Fortran was a language of choice for the same reason that three-legged races are popular. I've read that probably a thousand times and I still don't exactly know what he means there. Is he saying that three-legged races are like dumb and they use Fortran because it's like, well, you just kind of got to do, I don't. It's, it's, a, a, it's a challenge. Yeah, it's it's yeah, a challenge, okay, yeah. I guess that's what it is. All right, well, anyway. Um, so he, uh, he would do this, but um, he's going to do it in C. So we'll hopefully we recognize uh, C in general. Um, but here's the idea from this. He said, write a program that prints out its own source code. And if you think about it, um, well, and we're going to in a few minutes, you're going to kind of think about it with your neighbors or whatever. There are challenges involved with that. The first time I heard this, I went, oh, that's easy. And I started writing and I went, oh, it's not so easy, <laughs> right? So we're going to talk, and then I'll show you a couple, and, and, and we'll do that. Um, and then he says, uh, look, if you've never done this, I urge you to try it on your own. The discovery of how to do it is a revelation that far surpasses any benefit obtained by being told how to do it. In other words, don't go and look at the, the answer before you actually stretch your brain a little to try to figure it out, okay? Here's what he's talking about. Another name for this is... Uh, it's called a quine. And um, the Wikipedia article defines a quine as a non-empty computer program. There's lots of little, like, you know, you could say an empty C program prints itself out because it just doesn't print anything out, whatever. Um, but let's say a non-empty program takes no input. This is an important part. It takes no input, but also you can't read anything into it. You can't read your source code and then print it out. That's cheating in this, in this method. Um, the standard terms for these programs in the computability in computability theory and computer science literature are self-replicating programs, self-reproducing programs, or self-copying programs. And I understand that yesterday in CS103, you talked about this sort of thing as well. So these are things we talk about in, um, in uh, theory of computation type classes. Quine, I found out from the Wikipedia article, was coined by Douglas Hofstadler in Godel Escher Bach. I, didn't, I thought he was just using it. I didn't realize he actually came up with that name in there. Um, and then there's a... It, it, do you know what, why it's called Quine? Can I talk a little bit about Go right ahead. OK, so it's really easy to construct uh, undecidable sentences in English. Like, for example, the sort of like canonical one is, that sort of says in my crazy handwriting, this sentence is false. But you'll notice it contains self-reference. So W.B.O. Quine was a philosopher of language in the early 20th century, and he constructed the sentence, um,
yields falsehood when preceded by its quotation, yields falsehood when preceded by its quotation. Okay, so this doesn't involve self-reference directly. It just so happens that the sentence, the thing that it refers to, is in fact itself. So this is how we constructed a, a, a undecidable sentence without that sentence ever explicitly using a self-referential word like this. And you'll see in the structure of his of the Kleins why Hofstadter assigned the name Klein to this sort of program. Yeah, very good. So there you go. Um, so. A Klein is, as I said, just a program that prints its own source code. And I want you guys to take a few minutes and try this. Who has done this before? I know Frost said he'd done it before. Who's done this before? Great. Even though you read the paper, you still might not have gotten enough, gleaned enough information from it to go, oh, I get the idea here. Let's try it on our own. Here's what I want you to do. So you can pick any programming language. I might suggest Python if you know any Python, because it's probably the easiest thing to like at least kind of try very quickly. If you don't have a particular programming language you're not good at, you, aren't, you don't know much about or whatever, grab somebody who does know a little bit and talk about the idea about, about what you're going to do. And I want to spend about, let's spend until 2 p.m. just thinking about this and trying to write some things down and at least get something typed into your computer where you go, okay, if I was going to print its own source code, that would be it. So again, what does that mean? Let's actually look at like what, a, like some program. Uh, test quine pi, right? Okay, uh, let's say we had a thing that said print, you know, this is a program. Okay, well, that's the program we want to print, right? So our program has to print, print this is a program, but this is our program, so there's something inherently a little more difficult to it than this. Right? If we want to print, this is not a self-replicating program because it doesn't print, print this is a program. It just, on what comes out is this is a program, not print, quote, print, parentheses, quote, this is a program, end quote, end parentheses. So do you get what we're trying to do here? You get what we're trying to do here? We're trying to make a program to print its entire source code. Okay? All right. Find a partner or something. Don't try to do this on your own because I want you to talk it over and talk about the big idea here, okay? Find somebody next to you to chat about. You guys wanted you guys talk and you guys talk and whatever. Just talk about like what the big idea is going to be and type something out, right? Like I might continue this and go, wait a minute, this isn't going to work. So I might want to say, oh, how about this? Uh, print, print parentheses that this is a, well that's not going to work because I've got the little quote in there so but that's the basic idea that you're going to try to do that right and then the problem with that is now it's going to have to print 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 you'll see give it a shot take about 15 minutes and think about it if you you will win a prize well I don't have a prize but maybe I'll come up with a prize if you actually write one from scratch in 15 minutes it took me a little longer when I did it but you may do it anyway talk it over What if you, if you like, you do a I don't, I, that idea is not flushed out. Yeah, that's okay. You like, calls this program a gas. The first part. Yeah, the trick is just So, like, the first part Go talk to The first part prints, like, print this is a program. And then. And then, like, returns, like, returns, whatever. Oh, oh, I've got my Oh, I'm going to show you something. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to share Can I go? Mine's about that long. Oh, mine looks pretty similar. Pretty similar. So, uh, if you look at what Peter made, there's, there's a Python one that's 12 characters long. Yeah. So, like, if I search up some of the extra to log out, like, this is a program. Like, uh, like, can I just like do it for everyone? Yeah. 
<laughs> mine does not work. If you're trying to look at mine, mine does not work. This is not going to do it. But you might see the problem. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you're not supposed to like self. You're supposed to use self reference. Well, does it? We're just doing exercise to print out the program. What language are you doing? Um, But then, like, uh, wait, uh, so the something needs to. It's so Something's going to happen. Although, I'll give you points for creativity on this. What are you guys thinking? Figured out any problems yet? You're not allowed to refer to file and read your You have to do it embedded in the text of the program. Do I have to try to read it? So we can't, so we can't read um, so like basically having the, the whole program stored inside of itself, right? But, but then, then like, good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But does it necessarily? Because we need to place that all the time. Uh -huh. So how did you do that? How would you print the printing without, without yeah. saying? Well, I would have to like print it. This is just going to be recursive. Think about that. Yeah. 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 Oh, wait. Did I print it? Did you guys do this in 103? No. They just, they always just had a pseudo code that was like self reference. What do you have so far? We were thinking like, try to do some sort of uh, recursive call. Uh, but you have to you have to you have to base case. You're doing a recursive call. I know, that was it, yeah, that was, a, that was what we were running into. Okay, I like the way you're thinking about it. I think we could. So that's how you do like level, like line elements on the top. So, um, like we can do that. Base case and then it's just here. So, we're going to get rid of the main array. Maybe you don't have to call the main array. Maybe you want another array. Because then you have to return the same array to like that next array. Maybe you don't have to call the main array. Maybe you don't have to call the main array. Yeah, we did this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, anyway, it depends what you mean by exact statement. Are you in C or some other language? Yeah, that was Everyone like warned that it was super dangerous way back when, and then. Just like this, though. Just like this, though. Oh, I forgot yeah. to make an So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 What did he do there? And now we need to, you know, make it. Get a chance to read it. Oh, too bad. Uh, go to the website and just, just start reading it for a few minutes. Um, we're, what we're talking about now are these. Have you ever written a Klein? Heard of a Klein? It's a program that prints out and it's supposed to be used for source code. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you written those before? Yeah. I think you showed it in one of the other ones. Yeah. That's right, I think I might have. Uh, that's right. Um, did I want to say that? Yeah. Anyway, anyway, we're trying to do that now, just briefly, or the next 10 minutes or so. He definitely showed it in one of three. That's what I heard. Um, maybe not back then. He might have changed. He might have just added it or something. Did he? So that is the, the quote yields falsehood when preceded by its quotation. Yields falsehood when preceded by its quotation. So in other words, whatever we put the quotation precedes the statement of itself. And that's when it, and then and this is a, a non-computable sort of idea. It's got, an, it's got an issue of like, well, there, there's a kind of paradox in there. It's inherent. But that's, that, 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 that form is something you might want to think about when you're trying to do this. But if you just print that out, it prints out everything except for the intellectual part here, right? So, 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 Find this, like this is tricky, isn't it? Right? Um, but I'm going to be really sure that I'm going to If I wanted to, um, if I wanted to up here print, print without writing print, could I do something like this? Oops. 
printing out one letter. I'm not saying you can't. I've lettered. I'm not saying you can't. 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 I'm not saying
All right, how about this? Pause on this. This can be your homework assignment if you want <laughs> to continue working on this. Who can tell me some concerns they have about what they're trying to think? Like, what was the first stumbling block you ran into when you thought about doing this? Every time you would try to print something, you would also need to have a print for that print thing. Yeah, every time you try to print something, you'd have to have a print thing for that, and you run into this problem of like, oh, I'll just do this forever, and it'll, it'll continue. So that's the biggest one right there, right? You have to kind of uh, figure that out. Like, what, what makes it so that you can print something that you can then print again without having it be this non-terminating sort of thing. Anybody else have any big like things or didn't did you guys realize anything by doing has anybody realized anything? Like, oh, here's one way I can do it. I kind of started to put up some some ideas of maybe what you can what you can do here. What do you what are you thinking? What are you guys thinking about? Or how to solve that problem? How to yeah, how to solve that problem. Have your like okay so like here you have your program in the string right mm -hmm. and it's kind of self-referential so if you like if you you couldn't like you like you've run into the problem where it's like infinite mm -hmm. um, but if you put some sort of like signal or something inside that string to kind of indicate um, like okay here's where I'll insert the code one more time yes um, then that you kind of like stop Right. You so so you need some sort of state to say, here's what I'm doing again. Like it's going to be this. I'm going to redo, but I don't have to retype it. Yeah, yeah. That sort of thing. Okay. So maybe using some variable to hold the information about that before you redo it. Now, I'm in a bit of a quandary here. I want to follow what Thompson says about like it. The learning this on your own and struggling with it really is an aha moment. So here's what I'll, I would here's what I'll do. I, I will show you the one I came up with. If you don't want to see it or pay attention to it, then just go look, look at something else for like, like three or four minutes, okay? But let me show you the one that, it took me about, I don't know, it took me about probably all together, probably half an hour, 45 minutes to like puzzle through it. So don't, don't think, oh my gosh, I, 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 I uh, you guys, I didn't give you enough time. Let's put it that way. But this is what, um, let's see, I think it was this one. Yeah, okay. So this is mine, let me make it bigger. Okay, so here's what I what I did. Okay, so I ended up now. This is not the way you necessarily have to do it, but what I thought about was, look, if I'm going to print out a sentence, I'm going to need some things in that sentence to print out. Like for instance, new line character, quote character, right? A backslash. I had a backslash character in here. It turns out I did the whole thing with it, and I said, oh, I don't actually need it because I can do that with just uh, with with like without using that, but because I didn't need any backslashes as it turns out. But what have I done here? I've said, okay, uh, the new line character happens to be the ASCII character 10. So I just defined it that way. The nice thing is it has no new lines in it. Ah, so there's something nice, right? Quote is CHR, that's, that's a character 39, no quote marks in there. Equals, same thing, the equals character. Then I said, okay, A, I didn't need to do it with all these variables, but I have just the way I came up with it in my brain. A equals the first line up there. B equals the next thing down there. And notice there's no things that I'm repeating in here. And that's where you start running into problems, where you're repeating things, right? And so same sort of thing. I've got all these. This is the key one here. I am going to try to print everything that comes before it, including this one, once, <laughs> right? And then I'm going to do basically the same thing, except in a slightly different way. When you do this, it ends up where you did you you like it's like I, I light bulb I now. I I now. Yeah. So so let's see what this is actually doing here. Okay. So the, this is the first. This is the only real print statement in it, right? Okay. This is saying print. Okay. A. That's this one, right? And then I need a new line in there. Well, great. I've defined a new line, but I don't want to put a new line because then. I would have to put quotes, and then I don't want to put quotes, so I could probably get away with it doing it without doing the new line character. I didn't go quite that, maybe I didn't go quite that far. But anyway, A, new line, new line, okay. Then can I print out B? Well, B is this one, new line, that's not, I need a new line after that. New line after B. And then same thing for C and D. And then this one, this was A. That's actually the character for A. So instead of printing how would I do a quote A there without like 
use, needing to use a quote later. I'm trying to, in here, I can't use anything else I've already defined. Like, that's part of the issue. You've got to kind of define it in the order where you do it. So here I go, okay, fine. How else could I print an A? Well, that's how you can print an A, right? And then I need an equal sign, because look, I need an equal sign. And then I need a quote. And then, actually, at that point, I don't, <laughs> right? I need an equal sign. Oh, I'm sorry, I do need a quote, because I need to actually print the quote. Then I print A, which is this inner terminal part. And guess what? I need a quote and a new line. And so that's in there, right? OK, so that whole thing is there. I got most of the way done with this, and I went, wait a minute. What's the print statement? Oh, <laughs> right? I needed. I, I think I did it first without even having the E part in there and going, oh, that was another like area where you go, oh, fine. I needed to figure out how to do the E in this one, but the E in this one was this one. So this is the self-referential kind of part here. OK, now, here, let me run this for you. OK, if I run this, then let's see, Python. Actually, I can just do it this Well, I can do it this way. Python uh, quine.py. And there it goes. Now it printed out the entire text of the thing. It printed it all out. And you can walk through, back through it and go, oh, and you walk through and you go, there's the recursive kind of part to it, and whatever. Here's an interesting thing. You can test these by doing Python quine pi and then pipe it through Python. Because the output of that should just do the same thing. And I could pipe it through Python all day. The output of that pipes through Python again, <laughs> pipes through Python again, but right, and it should still just continue to go, oh, fine, I'm gonna whew, continue to continue to do this. Okay, now hopefully that, that Hopefully that gave you some things to think about if you want to go back and do your own. Mine is certainly not the shortest. In fact, let me show you a very short one in, uh, in see, this is mine. That's the, the whole one there, right? That's, you know, what, 20, 15 lines or something. But, um, but again, if I define something up here, I can use it down here, but I can't use certain things that are in the definition that I would need to redefine, like the, the quote, I need to use a quote because I'm going to need it down here to print out this line. So you have to kind of do that. OK, that's mine. I call it a mediocre attempt. It's not that short. This is the short, a very short one um, in Python. If you have that, what is that doing? It says it's defining s as the quotation s equals. That's good. We can see that's going to be this part, right, in the space in there. And then percent r. That's in Python how you can also do a new line or a, a quote character percent r, and then a backslash n, uh, percent, yeah, but in this case, percent r it refers to itself, right? Yeah, it refers to itself, rather. And then you do a backslash, and then you can print, and then you print this, and this means what? It means print s, and then again, maybe? I think, or maybe s is in, yeah, it's printing that in, I don't exactly know that, so anyway. It's a Python, nice Python kind of thing there. Um, and if you, go ahead. I think the S, so the, the S percent S thing in the print is yeah. Python's way of saying the left side is a format string and the right, right side is the thing to put in it. So it's putting in the second S in where the percent R is supposed to be. Um, so the format, so. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Because so it was, you're taking advantage oh, because percent that R is. Percent R means, well, you're taking advantage of percent means something. You're also taking advantage of percent R means what? Percent of raw string or something like that. That's probably what it is. Raw string. So it's taking this whole thing and putting it back in under yeah, where percent R is. Okay, I think you're right about that. Yeah, that's what it means. You're right. So I'm pretty sure that's pretty sure. And then the raw string probably part means it's going to well, put it in quotes or something. See what, let's see what it does. Let's just check and see. Yeah, probably puts it in quotes. This is what, maybe what you were talking about, the thing there. Python, uh, print percent %r percent %a, b, c, d, e. Aha, it does do it. It puts the little quote around it. That's what it does. So it actually does the quotes for you. That's what it is. So this one would be single quotes would also do the same thing in Python, right? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Huh. Well, anyway, that's a nice Python trick or whatever, I guess. As I said, you can test these by just running it through them all the time, and it just does the whole thing. OK, so that's a pretty short one. Um, quines are like just the beginning. <laughs> OK? There are other people. Now, remember, these are like puzzles and games. And many of you are in computer science because you like that aspect of computer science, right? Well, you can go down this rabbit hole very, very deeply. Um, an Ouroboros quine 
called a Quine relay is a Quine that is written in one language, outputs a program in a different language, that when run outputs a program in the original, the original program in the original language. If you're of a one relay sort of race, okay? This can be expanded to many, many levels of, of um, thing. Let me show you one that works just, that works this way. And it's, you can download this and it's on the, uh, the page. So let's see, mm, reset. Okay, uh, okay, there it is. It's called uh, quine.java. Java. Okay, so this is what it looks like. It is a program in Java that prints out a program in C++ that itself prints out a program in Java that's the original program. And it's only 50 lines long. And we can do this. We can do Java, quine.java, which will create a, uh, let's see, quine maybe? Oh, no, Java C. Java C, quine.java. There you go. That will compile it into a class file. And then if we do Java, quine.class, is that what I have to do? I never know how to do this from the command line. Nope. How about just quine? There we go. That printed out the C++ version. So that's what that did. And then if we pipe that into quine.c++ and then make it, make quine, that will produce a binary file called quine, which if then we run again, produces the whole Java C, Java program, which thus produces the thing. So okay, that's a quine relay. So that might be a little tricky, right, to do that, to do that work. Well, that's, uh, we'll, we'll see another example of that in a second. There, um, there's another one called a multi-quine, which is also kind of cool, and another one which your mind is like, multi-quine is a set of R different programs in R different languages, each of which is able to print any of the other programs according to the command line it's passed. Put that in your brain for a second and stir it around, <laughs> right? Uh, again, you can't, you can't, well, there's some things about command line arguments can't be too, there's some cheating involved. But anyway, that's another kind of a quine. Okay. There is an astounding Ouroboros quine. Okay. That is a quine. You can go to this website and do it and get it. It is a program that is originally written in, these are languages, all different languages in alphabetical order, by the way. I think the first one was written in Ruby. The Ruby program produces a program in Rust which when run in Rust, when compiled in Rust, produces a, and run, compiled, produces a program in Scala. That one produces a program in Scheme, which produces a program in something called Scilab, and then Sed, which is not even really a language, but I guess it's turned complete. And then there's another language called Shakespeare, which is a, like, it sounds like Shakespeare, a hundred times, all the way back to R-E-X-X, -X, which produces a program that's the original one in Ruby. A hundred different programs. And this is 128, right? This one says 128, so I guess there you go, 128 different programs. Um, yeah. <laughs> so this is nuts, uh, right? Brain fucks actually in this circle. Too. Yeah. Brain fucks in this short. And, sure. and um, Piet, which is a programming language that is purely graphical and programs in it look like um, uh, paintings by the artist Piet Mondrian. Yes, they actually, it's a graphical programming language. So yeah, now this guy says on his web, or you go to the GitHub and it's got a little FAQ and the first thing it says is like, why? And he's like, here, I got lots of reasons why, <laughs> but it's interesting. Uh, and then the second one, the second question is like, well, how do I get another language in here? Well, the second question is how long did it take? And he goes, infinity time, because it's infinity, and I don't know, it took him a long time. Um, I think he's got a plan though of how to do the next. Four Fortran versions. His Fortran versions, yeah, a bunch of Fortran versions or a couple of Fortran versions. But he said, if you want to add a language, you have to be able to compile the language in Ubuntu, Linux, and you can do that. And he gives a make file for doing this. So I tried it one day. It takes like an hour to do all this. But you have to download on 99 or 128 different compilers. And then you have to run them all. And so now my Unix box can compile any language you can think of, basically. Mm -hmm. But it will, uh, it will do that. So anyway, very cool stuff. All right. There's a language called Whitespace in there, which is, uh, ignores all letters and other characters. So yes, Whitespace is a great language. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yes. There, 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 you can, if you want to add one, you have to have a compiler for Ubuntu, and then you tell him, and he might do it. Is yeah. Spot a more polite name for Brain F? Whitespace. No. No, because Brain F. It's right there. <laughs> 
brain oh, fuck is right there. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, white space is a different language. Yeah. Um, anyway, go check this out sometime if you want to. OK. All right, that is all set up. OK. The idea that you can produce a program that produces itself is all set up for what's happening next. And back to, we're back to Thompson now. OK. So Thompson actually gives an example in the part of the example in the, in the code. But here's what he says. He says, OK, that was stage one. I can produce these programs that produce copies of themselves, et cetera. Then he says, look, the C compiler is written in C. I don't know if you knew that, but to compile the next version of the C compiler, GCC, you use GCC. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Right? You use GCC to compile. And then the question is, how did you do the first one? That's the chicken and egg kind of thing question you had here. What you actually have to do is you have to write a compiler in some other language or an interpreter and that, that, you know, in either some other language or in itself. And then you use that to compile the original language and then start compiling everything else from the compiler you just compiled. It's a kind of a fun recursive kind of thing there. But the most languages, if they get to the stage where you can compile your own compiler in that language, you've kind of arrived. Because that's a hard thing to do is compile your own compiler. OK. Now, so everybody with me there? All right. Now, he's going to use an example here. He says, C allows a string construct to specify an initialized character array. In other words, you can have a character array in C. Okay? And then you, uh, you can escape certain characters using the backslash to pr produce these special characters. Okay? So this is a hello world with the special character, which means go to the new line. All right? That's what that character means. That doesn't mean anything in ASCII. I mean, that means in C, that means go to the new line. We have to teach the compiler how to do that. So what he does is, here's, here's a little code. Sorry about the blurriness there. I dragged it from the, the paper itself. Um, here's, what he's, here's part of the compiler reading input to basically put to, uh, to print something out. It reads a character, and C equals next. If the character is a backslash, that's two backslashes in quote here. If it's a backslash, right? That, or sorry, if it's not a backslash, then it's just a character. You print it out. That's what it's going to do. If it is a backslash, then we're down here, and it says, OK, read the next character. If that is also a backslash, it means we're printing a backslash character. Because backslash backslash means backslash character. Are you with me there? If it's, not, if it's not backslash, if it's n, we need to return backslash n. Now, this means that the compiler knows that backslash n means new line. But it's in the compiler. So at some point, we had to have something else in there. OK, let's see what he, his next comment is, OK, fine, this is what it does. But what happens if we want to add a new type of character to this compiler, a new type of like uh, escape character? So he says, what if we wanted to add the vertical tab, which is backslash v, as it turns out, which just means go down some number of lines. That's really all it means. All right? If we wanted to do that, could we do this? If, remember, the compiler doesn't know what backslash v means yet. If we tried to compile this with our current compiler, we would get, he calls it a diagnostic, we would get an error. Because they would go, I don't know what that character means. <laughs> right? We want to write this, but we don't know what that character means yet. All right? So we go, oh, well, how do we actually do that? Well, we have to train the compiler to understand what backslash v means. We look it up in our ASCII table, and it turns out it's, what is it, 10? 11. 11, rather. 11. Yeah, it's 11. And so what we do instead is we go, fine, here's the program we're going to first run through the compiler. We're going to run a program that says, OK, if you see backslash v return 11, that means that it's going to be the, the correct uh, thing, right? You compile the compiler, and then this becomes the compiler. And then you take the compiler and compile the previous one, which now this now knows what a backslash v is because it's going to put spit out 11. Right? So if you go back with the new compiler and compile this one, you end up getting it, it actually works. <laughs> right? Go ahead. And uh, Thompson doesn't really like dwell on this, but something that kind of baked my noodle about this is that version is in a way more powerful than the version where it specifies what uh, backslash v means in ASCII. Oh, because yeah. if you're using some other character set, if you're using like xdict or something like that, something like that. Uh, that works. And yeah. the other one doesn't. 
Correct. That works because you had to originally on each computer compile according to the, the original on there. You can't just take today's compiler and compile and, and you would have to compile it first, right? And you already need a compiler. I mean, this presumes that at some point somebody wrote something that can compile C itself. Whether it's a C compiler or something else, that's what it, it, it is. But by the time it gets to this level, the compiler has already gone through the steps of learning that a backslash V means 11 for this particular processor. And so that's all you need to do. So there's a little bit of weird, go, it's got to like stem all the way back to the original to train this. Okay. All right, you see why we had to train it first. That's kind of a key issue, right? You had to say, well, we don't know what backslash B means, so we have to train it, train it first, then we can start using it because it's already kind of baked into the underlying binary. Okay. All right, now, that's stage two, okay? This is pretty deep. Thompson says this is a deep concept. This is close to learning program, a learning program. You, see, you tell it once, and then it's a self-referencing definition that kind of harkens all the way back to when it was first, the first time you entered it into the language because that's the, the, the uh, original bit. And by the way, the original still has, a, the, the, this one still puts out 11, <laughs> right? But it happens to put out 11 based on the original, uh, the, the, it knows that backslash V means 11 now. Okay. Stage three. So in this case, now we can talk about his little fancy little program. That he, now we have the background here. He says, I'm going to show you a compiler that will miscompile source code if it happens to find that it's compiling something it recognizes. So he says, look, in here, if you're matching the string that you're reading in of the program you're about to compile, and it matches to something you recognize, go compile it with this extra code in there. Okay, so he says, oh, now I'm going to compile it with some extra code, which he's calling the bug. Okay? And in fact, what he is going, what this is going to be is the login. This is his little, his little thing. He goes, look, if I'm compiling the login program, I'm going to compile a login program with my own code that says that it's going to be that it's going to let me log in with my own password and any other like any somebody else log in. Basically, it's a backdoor. He's including a backdoor in this program. Okay. When he does this in the program, you can say, okay, fine. This just all it's doing is like searching whatever it's going to compile. It's going to if it sees that it's the login program, it's going to use its own login program basically. Okay, or compile it with a bug. All right. Now, and this is what he says, that it's the login. That would be easy to find, wouldn't it? I mean, you go look at the source code for the compiler, you go, wait, what is this? If it matches the login program, wait a minute, right? Great, so you say, fine, uh, no, no big deal. We go look at the source code and we, we say that, that you've got this bug or you've got this Trojan horse built in there, right? Easy at this point. Then he gets diabolical. This is the part that, oh no, did I, did I put it? Oh, there we go. Okay. This is where, what, what happened here? Hang on, did I, hang on, there we go. There it is, okay. This is where he gets diabolical. He says, oh, fine. If I see the bug program, compile it. If I see the compiler, compile it with the bug compiler. What does this mean? And by the way, this is the self, -pro this is now the, program that prints itself, basically, right? He's going to basically compile a program that for the, the compiler <laughs> and do this. So now this is targeted at the compiler. Once he does that, he's got a compiler that when it sees it's compiling the login, will change the login to be the bugged login. If it sees that it's compiling a compiler, it puts compile the bug and the compiler into the program and compiles that. Now he can actually remove all this from the compiler. And then anytime he compiles the compiler, the binary still has the bugs in it. But you look at the source code and it does not have any bugs in it. Because it's the compiler binary that's now got all those bugs in it. Right? This is diabolical. Because now he's got the a program, he's got a compiler, that if you look at the compiler, unless you go into the binary and look at what it's doing as it's compiling, 
you will not be able to find it. You say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna compile my new compiler here. I'm gonna, you know, whatever. If it recognizes that, it will throw this bug in there. Bad news, <laughs> right? And very, very hard to find. Now, he also goes on, I think in a different talk or something like that, to talk about the fact that, well, somebody said, well, what if you use the disassemble it and whatever. He goes, oh no, I've also bugged the disassembler. So anytime you compile a disassembler, it knows to put a bug in there that says you won't see this when you disassemble it, right? And somebody then says, well, well, what if I go and I look at the microcode for the processor you're on? He goes, no, 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 I've already done that too, or whatever. There is no level you can go to unless you have transistors that you've like sourced, like built yourself out of silicon, that you don't know that it has this, bu this bug at some level in it. So, and you can't find it. Like there's no way to find it given that you, that you have this bug in there. As long as, every, as long as the other parts are there. Now, if you can get a debugger that you know you trust, but how do you trust it? Well, you gotta trust somebody, that's the problem. Right, you can't do this without, so you can't just trust your code unless you built all the tools yourself all the way down to the hardware for the code. Whew. So, what does this really mean? It means that you can do something like this and then fake out the thing. You can compile all day, you can write, have your program and compile it, and as long as the compiler has this in it, it's going to maybe put a bug in your program. And you may have no, you will have no idea unless you go and disassemble the, the program code itself and look at it. Go back to CS107 or 107E and do your GDB skills and hope that your GDB isn't also compromised. If you don't think places like the NSA have built things like this, <laughs> you know, I got a bridge to sell you. Um, so, so I think that, you know, people have thought about this. So that's that. Now, what questions do you have about this? This the first time, first few times I saw this, I was like, I still don't quite get it. Chloe. Um, so I, I saw that it says the bug is in the binary, but I was thinking that if you took the bug out of the binary and took the source code it gave you, and then let's say you copied the source code and completely erased the hard drive and put the source code back in, I'm just wondering if I You'd still need to compile it though. Like it's presuming that you're using a compiler that has the bug in it already. You just, and then what you can, you, you're, you're gonna say, well, fine, I'm gonna take another compiler, compile this other program and use that. But it inserts the bug into that one when it compiles the compiler. So that's the problem. It's like inserting the bug into the compiler itself because it itself is the compiler and recognizes when it's compiling a compiler. When it rec yeah, that's the, Recursion part, yeah. So like presumably, so like the very first compiler is written in assembly, right? And it can compile C. Sure. Or, well, so or you can right. You have to write something, or in a, in a, you, you have to you have to build the first compiler in something. It's could be in a, it could be uh, an interpreter that's in C, but yes, you have to build. Okay, okay. But that would have to be an assembly or something like that. Okay, sure. Because yeah, you can't have yeah. something that sure. reads C. Yeah. C or yeah okay. Right. So then, say that like you audited that source code and we're like, there's no bugs in this. Next mm -hmm. version of the compiler, you also audited it. And you compiled it with the previous one, and you just kept doing this sort of chain all the way back. Like this, I think I think this attack basically relies on the fact that some that at some point somebody put a bug in, into the source, mm -hmm. compiled the new compiler, mm -hmm. deleted the bug from the and source, then everybody and uses everybody that. Everybody used the binary without yes. like seeing that in between version. Right now, the argument is great. I'm not going to bother with this whole C compiler business. I'm going to do it at the assembly language. So my assembler, you have to go and figure out how the assembler is working, right? And then you go the next, and you go, well, fine, I'm going to just do it in the microcode and the pro. I mean, you at some point, if you're clever enough, you do it. Now, if you took the assembler and assembled the and 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 you took the assembler which had the source code and you trust your assembler, but you have to trust the assembler. That's kind of the the uh, the, the tricky part. What other questions come up about like this? Intel Intel chip could realize you're doing a compile a compilation of you know, a compiler and then add it. So. The Intel chip could do that, right? So your chip has, yeah, your your chip has its own instructions that it's running, and if someone really wanted to do that, they could, you know. There was a there was a story a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago about an, about the Apple is it Apple chips or maybe I think it was Apple chips that they found like a little tiny other chip that somebody put onto the Apple chip that did, that does something. I mean, you know, in the factory in China or whatever, right? They had, somebody put that on there, and that wasn't in the original design, and somebody found it eventually, and they had to scrap all those. And you know, I don't know. It's it, yeah. There and remember, when you're talking about country 
level, like state level money, <laughs> you're gonna be able to do this sort of stuff. You're gonna be able to find the people that do it and like and hack, you know, get and get a mole into the company that's gonna do this. And it might be a ten year long process, but you know, who knows? It's uh, yeah, crazy. Well, that's presuming you are compiling all your stuff yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, that's again, you're, you're right. You'd have to like every time you compile something, you have to compile all, the, all the different things. Yeah. All the way back. Right. But it, it isn't that way. Right. It's not. It, right. You have to trust somebody, right? And yeah. Ben. And you're also assuming that they're gonna write like you know insert bug here really obviously like <laughs> yeah. it can even look legitimate yeah, like no, all the way through. You, you know? have to yeah. also audit it. Yeah. But you have to audit like you might like really deep too. <laughs> right. No, I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you would no, no. You were, and there are professionals who would be able to probably do that. But again, the point is that you, you know, you you might, if you were clever enough, you would have debug, you would have put the bug also in the other tools that person would have used, and yeah. So, what were you gonna say that? Yeah, I was just gonna say um, it's important to note sort of the ecosystem that he's working in. Um, mm -hmm. At this point, you know, when uh, Thompson and Ritchie are developing Unix, um, it's, a, it's like they are actually showing the source of everything they're doing, and they're. Right, but they might be using a binary that exactly. you know they're, you're not going to compile the original, 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 original C compiler because of all this training as it goes along as well. Anyway, you know, the original C compiler can't compile the latest stuff, but you get you got to go one step at a time too. Anyway, this is why this is this is so interesting. So here's the moral that he says: he says you can't trust code that you didn't that you did not totally create yourself, and totally is a very loaded word there. Right? He says totally. Like you didn't, you know, you created it your spell. Right? Then he says, especially code from companies that employ people like me. <laughs> <With these things. laughs> right? um, so he says no amount of source level verification will protect you from using untrusted code. That's just not not gonna happen, right? Um, he said he picks the C compiler, he could have picked anything. He could have picked the assembler, he could have picked the loader, hardware microphone. He says, look, I can go as low as you want. Somebody could do this at some level. Um, then it gets harder the lower you go. Okay. So that's the paper. Now, there is a paper. There are some people who have obviously thought about this. How do you counter this? Okay, you can go look up the. There's a lot of text down here, but there is a. There's a guy named Bruce uh, Bruce Schneier who's a um, security expert, and if you, he's written a lot of great books on security, and he has a uh, a terrific um, email list that he, he sends out once a month to people. I it's been going into my spam for some reason, but anyway, um, <laughs> probably some reason, probably a bug in my computer. Um, but he, uh, he sends us out and it's, it's very good. And he, he talks about all the current security things that go on. It's a little scary, um, but he talks about it. But he said that somebody wrote a paper on, hey, how would you trust this? Or how could you do this even if you don't trust a compiler? You do have to trust one compiler. <clears throat> the nice thing is that you can do this method I'm about to talk about without knowing which one you have to trust. It's actually kind of cool. All right, you ready for this? OK. Assume you have two compilers, A and T. Okay, and in fact, you have the source code SA and uh, of compiler A, let's say. Okay, and you have executable code from from both compilers. Okay, you want to know if the compiler that you're trying to use contains the attack that we've just talked about. When you compile it, if that is in the source code. Okay, and you can go read this later if this doesn't. If I go too fast here for this one. Compile source A with the executable binary of A. So that's what you do. Okay. That and remember, this is the compiler compiling its it uh, self. Okay, that's the idea here. Then you compile the same code with the other compiler, yielding another executable. Because they were both generated with two different compilers, they should have different binary code, which makes sense. But they should be, because different people, compilers compile to different binaries, like the, the way they compile. But they should functionally do the exact same thing. Right? <coughs> so what you should then do is compile the compiler with the one you just created from before, from the first one, 
and do the same thing with the, the binary you just got from the other. Now you've got two different executables, V and W, which are two levels through this process right now, right? But because they're using the same compiler, they should be functionally equivalent. They should be binary equivalent. Like they should be bit for bit equivalent. In other words, it's the same, supposedly, the same compiler is now compiling these programs, even though they were initially compiled with different, right? right? Okay. If either one of those two compilers is, has this bug in it, then they will, uh, then they will not be bit for bit the same, and you'll be able to go, aha, something fishy is going on with this compiler. Okay, so then you can do that. Um, now, you might say, well, what if they both have the bug? Well, then you're in trouble. So you do have to, com you do have to trust one of them, <laughs> right? But you don't necessarily need to know which one you trust. You just have to say, look, if they're not, if they aren't doing both functionally the same exact thing, then there, then there was no way, one of them was doing something fishy. Kind of cool. So that's kind of an interesting way of like, if you needed to do this. Now, that would be a lot of work <laughs> to go through and do this. But, you know, if you're the CIA, you might do stuff like this. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, um, if you're really properly paranoid instead of just like a little bit paranoid and you wanted to counter attacks at every single step in the tool chain, so like potential microcode attacks, assembler attacks, loader attacks, and so forth, um, you could make your trusted compiler on a machine literally just build yourself. So <laughs> yeah. if, I'm, if, if, if I'm recruited by the NSA, I, how you put it, I really hope somewhere in the NSA there's a computer that looks like Conrad Zeus's or something like <laughs> that, something that they built entirely themselves so yeah. they know they can have a trusted compiler. The trick is uh, your trusted compiler doesn't have to be very fast. So it only has to do it once. Yeah, it only has to yeah. do it once. So you can use completely obsolete technology, uh, which makes it sort of like a somewhat tractable problem. Yeah. Good luck building your own computer, right. but hey, you know you could you could do this. So so yeah, if you as long as you build stuff from scratch out of transistors, good luck. You're fine. <laughs> Why not? Okay. Well, guess what? <laughs> there was one that happened in the real world. Um, there's a programming language called Delphi that um, somebody did basically this exact same thing about. They um, they compiled a uh, virus basically into the source code, into the compiler itself, and then anytime anybody can use that compiler they would get the same bug propagated through. So this hack has happened in the real world, which is, uh, you know, happens. OK, so lots of references for this. Was that interesting stuff? That stuff is cool, I think. I mean, if, you're, if you want to think about security, um, there's a lot to think about. And, and smart people have done crazy things like this uh, that, uh, that you have to kind of worry about, I suppose. Or not, just you know, live your life. You know, probably not going to affect you. But then again, I'm going to go home and there's going to be something that says, like, my identity has been stolen or something. So, but, yeah, Ben. I've got to add something about the one that was caught in the wild. Um, yeah. So the compiler that it targeted uh, was mainly used when the, ti the time that was written in 2009, it was mainly used by people riding Trojan horses to steal <laughs> people's bank credentials. So he ended up he or she ended up um, infecting a lot of other virus writers' computers. Oh, that's funny. Um, yeah. Um, no, so, no honor among thieves, um, I guess. And so, so the virus itself, the W32 in .k, um, it didn't actually do anything but propagate itself. And sort of like all of the security researchers, their theory was that it was written by a bored grad student who had read Reflections on Trusting Trust. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, there's some videos in there. There's some other things that you can you can go and play around with quines. Um, if you get a chance, try to write your own quine. Um, you've seen one that works, but or a couple that work, but uh, try to write your own. It's kind of a, it is, as you've seen, a fun challenge. Now you have a little more insight into it. And uh, that's that. Other questions? All right, we'll see you next week.